All right. I'm also going to start my video so you can uh, see who's uh, presenting. My name is Tom Bartholomew from Rutgers University, and um, I'll be your pilot for today. And my wingman is a man who needs no introduction. Well, maybe he does, Joe Berkman. Uh, and he'll be our color, color commentator and also manning the chat. Um, this uh, presentation is uh, part of a series. Uh, we think of it as the second topic, uh, the restorative function of clinical supervision. But if you have the opportunity, feel free to, to join us for some of the other sessions uh, where we talk about uh, the other functions of clinical supervision, as well as uh, issues of implementation. All right, so what are we gonna try to do in this hour we have together? Um, the first thing is we're gonna describe uh, what is restorative supervision and its relationship to burnout prevention, uh, which is, I think, important to all of us. And um, particularly during this uh, time of COVID-19, uh, this, this presentation is more poignant. Uh, it's actually my favorite presentation of the, in the series. Uh, so you're in for a treat. I hope. Um, the second objective is uh, we're going to talk about activities that can serve as restorative interventions in clinical supervision. And there's no right or wrong for which interventions a supervisor uses, uh, but we'll give you some examples of stuff we use. And then the last objective is try to understand the relationship between reflective practice, which we'll describe, and uh, the restorative function in clinical supervision. So. I'd like you guys to take, take advantage of the chat function. And I know we have some folks on the phone, so I apologize for you. Uh, I don't think you're gonna have this capability. But what I'd like folks to do is list one self-care strategy that helps you in your workplace, in your work, and then one self-care strategy that helps you at home. And uh, Joe's gonna man the chat and just give us a sense of what's coming in. And we'll save this chat and send it along with this PowerPoint. Um, that you'll get at a later date. Uh, and the meaning, the reason uh, to, that we're talking about these self-care strategies is that they have a lot to do uh, with restorative supervision and what that entails. Okay, so we're just gonna keep going and, uh, and we'll get back to Joe in just a bit, but if you, if you can go to the chat function and uh, just address those two issues. What, what's a self-care activity at home and what's a self-care activity at work? Um, so the, the functions that I was describing in this series on clinical supervision uh, come from a woman, it's often called the Proctor model, uh, Bridget Proctor from England. And she coined these terms, uh, restorative, formative, and normative to refer to what are clinical supervisors supposed to be doing? Like what is the function of clinical supervision? And, um, so we'll talk a lot about restorative supervision today, but the other two functions, uh, the formative function is helping somebody form new skills uh, and attitudes and uh, the capabilities required for a professional within the field. Uh, so it's the formation of new uh, skills. So it's also the teaching and education function. And she talked about the normative function as the accountability function in clinical supervision. Uh, and these are, you know, are people showing up on time? Are people doing, you know, doing their job and maintaining an orderly, uh, efficient workplace environment? And interestingly, uh, people may have heard of Alfred Kadushin, who was a, a grandfather in uh, social work and wrote a very influential textbook. Um, and 17 years earlier, he identified three functions as administrative, educational, and supportive as the functions of supervision. And those are the same functions that Bridget Proctor, uh, 17 years later, coined a restorative, formative, and normative. And speaking of uh, restorative, yeah, Go these ahead. guys are uh, doing some really great, uh, really great things to, to provide self-care for themselves. Give some examples, Joe. Uh, they're, taking, they're taking breaks. Uh, they're standing and stretching at works. So maybe they have one of those special desks you can stand up and, uh, and work. Uh, actually, someone mentioned a fun team meeting. 
um, that they actually try to make the team meetings uh, uh, enjoyable to talk about uh, providing supportive stuff, I guess. Uh, short walks uh, was big on the list, uh, both at home and at work. Um, fun things at work, walking the dog, uh, cooking, yoga, you mean um, yeah, just connecting with family, um, yeah. you know, and, uh, and soccer. So, uh, nice. yeah. So people have some uh, interesting, uh, it's great interesting ways. It's really, is, yeah, it really, it really is good. Now the, the, the real important thing is to not only identify them, but make sure you do them too. Um, Absolutely. But that's great. Yep. Thank All you. Right your uh input okay so i mentioned it's three functions restorative formative and normative and if we were together in a room i we would be reciting these over and over and you'd get sick of them but restorative formative and normative and in fact if you take nothing else away that would be a, a good take-home idea uh and it was something that really helped me as a clinical supervisor just to think in terms of those three uh functions but what uh, writers in clinical supervision talk about is the unavoidable tension within clinical supervision of the need to be supportive of staff and promote psychological safety within supervision, and at the same time, hold staff accountable for the work they do and um, uh, you know, attendance and uh, record keeping and paperwork and things like that. Um, so this tension is, is really unavoidable and it's, it's part of the work of clinical supervision is to figure this out and make your peace with it. Um, so let's talk specifically about the restorative function. Um, this function in supervision in, encourages and supports emotional processing of what goes on in, in our jobs in mental health and as well as reflection and self-care and it seeks to support personal and professional growth. And we're gonna talk about that as um, uh, two sides of a, an important equation that you've, you know, you, you're expected to take care of yourself at work, but also you, you know, at home as well. Uh, and the promotion of uh, professional growth. Uh, this idea of reflective practice of being given an opportunity to, to think about what it is you do and how you feel about what you do and uh, whether you could do it better is really critically important. It's a big part of restorative uh, supervision. And this uh, also includes team building. And so I found that a focus on restorative uh, supervision and these things I'm, that I've just been talking about uh, tends to have the effect of building teams because um, people are talking about how they take care of themselves and, and what they struggle with and uh, clients that uh, they find uh, have challenging behaviors and, and how it feels to work with them, that kind of thing. So this function can also build resilience and I'm gonna present a model in a little bit uh, that I'd learned just a few days ago, which I just love it. Um, and it comes out of the University of Pennsylvania called the um, PERMA model. And uh, so also the restorative function uh, is one of the best weapons against staff burnout and the dangers of, that exist in working in mental health. So I'm going to give you a pro tip. So we've got three of them or four of them coming up. Um, so if possible, if you can address that tension in clinical supervision between psychological safety and accountability, if you can separate that, um, I would encourage you to do so. Now, most agencies, you can't do it. They're too small. Uh, we're fortunate within the uh, state psychiatric hospital system in New Jersey that we can do that. So I supervise people that I am not their administrative supervisor. So I don't have their uh, an accountability function in the same way. And it, it just makes it easier for me, I, I find. So that's pro tip number one. We'll review them at the end. So this brings us to this fork in the road, um, which really is asking the question, why are we doing restorative supervision? What's, uh, what's the point? And uh, I like to think about it as analogous to this idea of if within physical labor. Um, so you see a guy there uh, using a chainsaw, cutting some wood, as well as these two fellows on a beam. They don't look uh, very safe, frankly. But um, the idea here is 
that it's long been known that organizations have an obligation to uh, try to protect their workers and reduce the risks when and where possible. Uh, and so it begs the question, in our line of work, uh, which in industrial psychology, they would call our work emotional labor, uh, which I'd never heard that term before, but I like it, uh, which is defined as emotion sold for a wage. And I know it's, it's a little stark, but um, this is also true for people in retail, that the expectation is if somebody's interacting you, with you and you're working in retail, uh, you don't have the option of being nasty and <laughs> being angry at them, and uh, at least you shouldn't, right? It, it wouldn't make you a very good retail person. So this idea then is if we're part of what we bring to the table as mental health workers, or uh, a, a bring, we bring a certain emotion and a certain expectation of having, being in a certain emotional place. So what are the dangers of this kind of work? Uh, so these are certainly not all of them, but uh, these have been true in my life over the years. I find uh, there are times when I, this job is extremely high stress, uh, when I'm working with somebody that may be suicidal or dangerous to others. Um, it, there are times where it's just miserable work, right? That you've got to do things that are really unpleasant. Um, there can be, uh, at the organizational level, you can work with folks that have low commitment, um, that we can be experiencing poor treatment outcomes. There are things called vicarious trauma and compassion fatigue, which is our byproducts are, of working with people with really can, can very serious uh, issues in their life. And that can have an effect on us. And uh, one of the kind of uh, umbrella terms you see in the literature is called burnout. Uh, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about burnout. But <laughs> one other side effect of working in this field for many of us is uh, poverty. And I have experienced that uh, quite a bit in this, <laughs> in this field. Uh, there's other benefits other than money, but... Um, and you may think of other uh, dangers of this job. I mean, there's sometimes real physical danger if you're uh, outreaching folks who are homeless or drug addicted. Uh, of course, those also exist. All right, so let's just you talk about burnout because it's such a broad umbrella. Um, and um, Christina Maslach is the person I go to when I think about burnout. She's a researcher that uh, coined uh, or did a lot of the research in burnout. And she describes burnout as a reaction to prolonged or chronic stress and characterized by three main dimensions. The first dimension is exhaustion, particularly emotional exhaustion, where you're just like, oh my God, I can't, I just can't take anymore, I'm, I'm wiped out. And then uh, she says, in an effort to protect ourselves from any further withdrawal, you know, further uh, demand on our, um, on our emotions, uh, we begin to depersonalize those we work with, including our fellow staff people. And then lastly, our feelings of reduced professional ability, um, right? And this is really the, the last piece of the puzzle when um, we're trying to protect ourselves and in an effort to protect ourselves, we depersonalize and distance ourselves from uh, not only who we work with, but the staff and uh, clients. Um, so that sounds pretty horrible. And uh, sure enough, the, this construct of burnout has been really well studied, thousands and thousands of studies. And it's been found that uh, the, the scale that Christina Maslach developed, the uh, uh, Maslach burnout scale, is highly correlated. Uh, so if, you're, if you show burnout on her scale, you see also increased verbal and physical assaults of that person, which is fascinating. You see reduced quality of professional work, reduced job satisfaction, you see breaches in ethical conduct, uh, conduct, lower productivity, increases in physical and mental health related problems, so anxiety and depression. Also a negative contagion impact on colleagues. I don't know if you've ever been called a contagion before, but maybe in the time of COVID, <laughs> we, it's more common than it used to be. Uh, but I think many of us have seen this where if you have a coworker that's experiencing burnout, it, they're really negative and I, you know, I don't want to blame them because they're suffering, but um, it, it's a serious uh, situation. And then lastly, and maybe one of the most concerning things is this negative spillover effect on home life. So 
people that are experiencing burnout at work are also uh, having uh, issues at home, including marital, pro marital problems uh, and drug and alcohol use. So burnout's pretty bad. Um, the, at the organizational level, you, you see some of these same uh, relationships um, play out with uh, people that are burnt out uh, with morale and uh, what we mentioned, I mentioned ethical breaches, this kind of thing, organizational commitment and retention. The reason I bring this up is this is something uh, that I've been personally interested in and studying. And sure enough, the, 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 the study of organizational commitment, which is, uh, do you feel that your organization supports you? Uh, do you wanna stay with this organization? Uh, do you like the work you're doing? Are you thinking about leaving? And are you committed to your career? Let's say if you're a social worker or a counselor. All of these are highly correlated with uh, burnout. So for that reason, uh, it's, a, it's a good construct. Now I'm gonna send um, a bunch of materials, including the Maslach burnout scale and these organizational commitment scales along with this uh, PowerPoint. So if you're interested in these measures, if you even just wanna look at them or take them yourself, uh, they'll be available and they come with a cheat sheet uh, that so you can score the uh, scales if you choose to. So this is just some information on the uh, study it was about 1700 people uh, took this and in our case here in New Jersey in the state psychiatric hospitals about 22% of the clinical staff uh, uh, came in as uh, you know uh, levels that would be considered burnout and 34% of the support staff which is really interesting support staff are maintenance folks and um, housekeeping and uh, folks working in the food service. And Tom, because of the pandemic, you know, because of the current pandemic, because of the COVID-19 situation, probably some of these exp high expressed emotion feelings, uh, uh, these are probably even for some people more prominent um, because your level of stress that you get, even with your attempting to manage stress coming from above you as a supervisor and stress coming from below you uh, can become even more discernible and more impactful as well. Yeah, you're making a really good point. It's exactly why I think this is such a, an important uh, presentation and this, this idea of restorative supervision is so critical at this time. So uh, this slide is just talking about EE is uh, emotional exhaustion. It's that uh, it's the first dimension within uh, the Maslach construct. And you can see it's highly correlated with all these negative <laughs> things. Uh, so the other thing we found in studying uh, burnout was that sometimes senior staff may be burnt out, but it's too costly for them to leave their job. And we call this golden handcuffs. It's a little less prominent, I think, in community practice uh, and more so in civil service, which is our state hospital uh, system, where uh, you know, the, the, pension, uh, the pension is part of the golden handcuffs. So this is from my mother. Uh, <laughs> the plumber's pipes are always leaking and my mother's father, my grandfather was a plumber. So I guess she knew what she was talking about. I think what's hilarious, if you can see this picture, there seems to be an extra arm in there. Uh, so the guy is trying frantically to <laughs> deal with a leak and uh, there appears to be an arm, uh, uh, an additional arm. So someone else perhaps is getting squished. So what does this mean? I've, I've found that uh, people that work in mental health are uniquely able to support others and be there for other people. Uh, but I think sometimes their pipes are leaking. In other words, uh, we're not always the best at taking care of ourselves. I've heard this described as a wounded healer <laughs> where you, part of why we're doing this work is it, we have a wound, but we're not, it, we're not turning that focus on ourselves all the time. So uh, part of my study of uh, burnout and restorative supervision led me to this idea of a buffering hypothesis and that suggests that the negative effects of emotional labor, of emotional labor, uh, can be mitigated through organizational support, and particularly through this type of supervision that we're talking about right now. 
And so this is really, all of this was just a, a way to make this argument that this is really important. Um, and it's not the only piece of the puzzle, but it's an important piece. And one of our one of our attendees, Wanda, uh, talks about the inability to ask for help can be a response, a trauma response, and and, and that is really really uh, important. Though, and we'll talk, I think, a little bit about vulnerability and mm -hmm. and the importance of vulnerability to uh, uh, to supervisors and how to provide a safe environment. Uh, in which to to do restorative supervision with uh, your supervisees. Mm, yeah, that's a good point. Um, so here's another exercise. I encourage you again to use the chat function. I'm going to keep going because uh, we've got a lot to cover. But um, just give some thought. Is there a, is there a self care activity that you've been thinking about doing? that you might commit to try uh, to start or something you used to do that you maybe want to get back to. I personally have, have a guitar sitting in the other room that, that I don't think I've touched in six months. So that's my commitment, just to go pluck on the guitar. I've, I play the five, same five songs for 15 years. So that's about my level. All right, so go on to the, if, you're, if you want to, go on to the chat function and just uh, identify a self-care activity you might be willing to commit to give a try. Okay, so at this point, come to the second fork in the road, and this is, speaks to the, the first exercise where it was the, the difference uh, between uh, your work life and your home life. Um, the balance of personal and professional self-care and uh, this is something I never really thought much about. I was doing a similar presentation to this one and someone said, uh, right, I have personal self-care and professional self-care. And I'm like, oh, that makes sense. Um, so let's just talk a little bit about what is the supervisor's role in staff resilience, in staff uh, warding off burnout and, and this kind of thing. So it should be uh, hopefully obvious to you guys, you're not, well, maybe you are therapists, but you're not therapists for your supervisees. <laughs> and um, as such, it's not your responsibility to attend to your supervisees um, self-care at home, right? That's their responsibility. And to some degree, their self-care at work is uh, also their responsibility. So what is your role as a supervisor? Well, the research uh, share uh, this Dewey in uh, 2020 suggested that encouraging personal and professional self-care and giving you know a, a forum to talk about it uh, is one thing that is within your role as a supervisor. And um, the next thing, providing information on stress management and encouraging stress management, as you can, uh, promoting support from others. So we do a group supervision where. Uh, we intentionally uh, try to encourage uh, peers to support one another. Um, and also, and this is what Joe was referring to, encouraging open discussions about vulnerability. Um, and this, is, this can be really important. Uh, we're gonna, I'll give you an example in just a minute um, about the, the, not only the importance of encouraging a place where people can be vulnerable, but why it can be so um, key to uh, doing this kind of supervision. Uh, before we get there, I wanna, th this is the model that I was exposed to just a few days ago, and I really, really liked it. Um, and if you're interested, you can just Google the PERMA model. Um, and it comes from this fellow Seligman, who's one of the fathers of positive psychology from the University of Pennsylvania. And if you're not familiar, positive psychology is the study of what makes us happy and well um, and resilient, as opposed to the study of what makes us ill, which is, if you think about it, it's really what the field of psychology has focused on is illness and uh, problems. And so in this uh, model, uh, Seligman says that these five dimensions, uh, if we attend to them in supervision, and it can be as simple as you know, how do you guys, uh, how do people, uh, what's the best way to experience positive emotion in your life? What, what helps you with that? Um, what do you feel engaged in? What is most engaging for you? 
playing guitar or somebody said soccer. Um, uh, somebody described, there's a book called Flow and I, I can never say the guy's name. It's a really long, I think Polish name, but it's a book about flow where if you're a dancer or uh, into yoga or ultimate Frisbee, um, you can kind of disappear into the engagement of that activity. He goes on to say, and this, is, this one's pretty obvious, I suppose, but uh, relationships are really critically important and critically important now that we're all uh, isolating, are there ways you can uh, reach out despite the, uh, the social distancing uh, can really make a huge difference. Uh, this one for me, meaning um, when I heard this, I realized that uh, I had been hunkering down uh, during this uh, pandemic, I work at home because I'm a faculty uh, for Rutgers and um, finding myself just more and more, trying, you know, just trying to avoid stress, avoid stress, avoid stress. And when I, after I saw this presentation, I thought, uh, you know, I have to do some self-actualizing and try to you know, reach out and find meaning and not just avoid uh, stress because it wasn't serving me. And then lastly, uh, what do you find, uh, produces feelings of accomplishment. Um, what are the things in your life that um, are making you feel like the, this is uh, a job worth doing? And um, so for, for me, uh, getting back into writing and that I, I often feel a sense of accomplishment. So I encourage you to check out this model and uh, even possibly use it in your supervision because uh, it fits well with this idea of a restorative approach. You know, Tom, one of the things that uh, I think uh, Seligman talked about and a number of uh, <clears throat> others have talked about is this idea that what you want to do in organizations is try to make uh, resilience part of your culture. And the more you can make it part of the culture of your organization, whether it's developing positive connections with the folks you work with, whether it's kind of looking at change in a, in a positive and, and, and open and flexible way, kind of viewing kind of when you, in stressful situations, kind of viewing them as being kind of resolvable um, and not letting them get the better of you and, and kind of trying to foster staff awareness, uh, not only of themselves, but what's going on around them. Um, and one of the things that I think uh, when you talk about PERMA is it's, om it's almost idea of, have, of it being a gift for you and, and a way of showing not only gratitude for yourself and what you do, but for what other uh, people in the agency do as well, so. Nice. Yeah, it's a good point. I know uh, many of the exercises that, that I find helpful are, are ones that focus on gratitude, as you were saying. Um, and it kind of jolts me out of my uh, Debbie Downer, woe is me uh, focus. So here's pro tip number three. And it's this, it's this weird thing about vulnerability, um, which I read in an article recently. It, the idea was that it's, what it said was that vulnerability, like if you are willing to be vulnerable in a group, that that creates trust and that it's not the other way around. Um, in, order, in other words, I, would have, I can imagine thinking, oh, if this is a trusting group, they're willing to be vulnerable. Um, so for example, if we were to do a round and we're gonna do an update on how are we doing, for example, and I start by saying, I, I am just a mess. Like I'm really struggling, I'm finding myself, I have a lot of anxiety and trouble sleeping me being vulnerable in that way says something to the group that this group can trust one, you know, more likely trust one another. Uh, so I encourage you, if, you're, if you weren't familiar with this idea, um, keep your eyes out for this idea that if you're willing to be vulnerable, particularly as a supervisor, uh, it can lead to a trusting group. Okay, so what are some exercises that we use um, in the, for, to a, address this restorative function in group supervision in particular. Uh, the first one is called the chaos inventory. And I believe, yeah. 
the, so the chaos inventory now we have i think uh, quite quite a few people yeah we got 35 people so um but it, describe what this is and if you're if you're interested you can put it in the chat um you can do this exercise this inventory in the chat so what this is about is the idea that when when uh, when we're under stress it can show up in areas of our life that maybe you wouldn't anticipate um a friend describes their car gets incredibly messy and they, they look like a homeless person because they just have all this stuff in there, uh, not to put down homeless folks, um, in their car. Uh, other people get, like myself, I get super clean and organized and tidy, uh, like ridiculously tidy. And, um, but these are, these are really um, how the chaos in my life is showing up. Um, it could be more concerning, uh, it could be drug and alcohol use. Um, I, I tend to smoke more cigars when I'm under stress. So uh, it, it, if you're interested and willing, uh, feel free to put in the chat, how does stress show up in your life? Uh, maybe in ways that you're not always aware of. And while we're doing the time, uh, a couple of, just a couple of comments uh, uh, from someone talked about vulnerability is not be being rewarded by employers is often not rewarded by employers, Interesting. Um, which makes it really difficult. And again, that's, that's that idea of uh, it not being uh, your agency, not being a restorative agency, if that's the case. Yeah. Also, we're surrounded by people in our lives that are not helpers. So they're, so empathy may not be part of their lives or the way they, uh, work with integrate and, and, and interact with people. Um, so we may get what, we may not get exactly the kind of response that we'd like to get um, from other people. Uh, and yeah, that's, that's, and that's part. And, and you know, when we work with people with uh, challenges um, in terms of uh, their emotions, also sometimes um, we kind of, uh, feel that their inability sometimes to connect with us um, is not as satisfying as it may be, but that's part of, it's part of who we are. Yeah. Oh, I think, I think that's really, really important is that uh, you always want to measure uh, your willingness uh, to be vulnerable. And also, you know, the question about, you know, whose needs am I trying to meet as a supervisor? If I'm sharing in order to support other people to share, uh, that's probably mm -hmm. a good use of uh, that kind of approach. And we've got some really good uh, examples yeah, what, what uh, you of these, of chaos. Uh, stress no eating. Yes. Hair trigger anger, sadness, yep. obsessively Ugh. cleaning. Oh, oh boy, boy that, that would be real chaotic for me. Oh my goodness. Um, unhealthy eating habits yep. and isolation. Uh, sometimes, uh, yeah, when you're feeling real stressed, uh, you don't want to be around people. Yeah, those are great. Jeff, uh, uh, Joe, go back and just check. Are there are people willing to try anything new? Because uh, we didn't oh, yeah. talk. About um, yeah, people talked about meditation. Nice. You know, yoga and Tai Chi are, are we, 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 did a program on Tai Chi in the hospital, which was very well received. Um, and kind of in all kinds of uh, self-care, um, the spiritual uh, yeah. or meditative piece uh, can be really, really helpful um, in reducing your level of stress and helping you to, to cope more effectively. Reading was another example. Um, uh, Another person talked about uh, being more vulnerable, oh. um, and that may have to do with the with the whole gratitude thing. Um, and the other one talked about the supervisor as coach uh, yeah. as well. So um, there are definitely and by and by the way, uh, earlier on uh, we missed a couple who talked about uh, uh, going out and uh, hanging out with the horses nice. and. Uh, uh, kind of uh, working at home and when it's uh, the sun's not yet up. Uh, so there's, 
yeah, there's a lot of things we can we can do with. Um, oh, and someone just talked about a place where they let you break glassware in a soundproof room. Nice. There's a, there, now there's a there's a great idea. Yeah, um, great. You know. Um, you know, here in New Jersey, they there. I just heard about this place. They let you throw hatchets that that stick in the to a stump, I guess. And uh, but it's the same kind of thing. It's just a, a visceral kind of uh, feeling, I suppose. Physical illness, yeah, and physical illness is about uh, just came up as another one, and, and and being kind of increasingly pessimistic about yeah. what goes on. You know, I think part of the, the key is is this idea of of awareness, knowing where you're at, and and not only being aware of where you are, but having some kind of things you can do yeah. to uh, to kind of move that mood to to so you're feeling more resilient and you're able uh, to have a go-to, you know, some go-to things you can do to provide yourself with self-care. Whether, again, whether it's, whether it's the breaks we talked about before or whether it is, uh, you know, connecting with somebody uh, at work. Yeah. You know, your sort of practice walking barefoot through the sand. There, there it is. Yeah, connecting with nature if it's, if it's not freezing outside or even if it is freezing outside. Yeah, so it, I remember when I was first uh, starting to explore this idea of restorative supervision and giving people an opportunity to, we call it reflective practice, it's, but it's also a type of mindfulness. Um, and I just remember doing a round and somebody was talking about emotional eating, similar to what we heard earlier. Um, and I realized that I had just ordered off of Amazon a big bag of assorted candy <laughs> and I had been eating it the night before and it didn't feel that well afterwards, but um, without really being mindful about what that was about, I just thought, you know, I like candy, who doesn't? Uh, but really it was part of the chaos uh, and the stress of my life. And it, if it wasn't for that round I did with my colleagues, um, you know, I'd probably still be woofing down candy uh, because I, you know, I did choose to, uh, you know, try to identify a, a healthier alternative. <laughs> so good. All right. So that's one exercise. Um, the other thing is, is, and somebody mentioned it, uh, I think, as a self-care activity uh, or something I want to try or get more into, is this idea of mindfulness. And uh, out of Toronto, Canada. Um, they've been studying this for a long time and they define it as an awareness of the current moment without judgment. And uh, the, so many of my colleagues and myself have a practice. So every morning I sit and just try to be present and just see what kind of craziness uh, flows through my head um, and not try to uh, adjust it necessarily. I do sometimes do uh, thankfulness uh, exercises, but this is the idea. And of course, there's a lot of uh, material out there to support your uh, mindfulness. And at the very beginning of the chat, if you guys want to scroll back, there's a, I put a link in at the beginning of the training, at the beginning of the chat, which is a link to the website that Joe and I manage. And um, there's a, just a huge number of mindfulness activities. There's also a huge number of free trainings in uh, motivational interviewing and cognitive behavioral interventions and group uh, facilitation. Um, uh, just a whole, I think there's over 30 trainings, all free. Um, mm -hmm. so I encourage you to check that out. Um, Let me also mention that with, with my, one of the great things about mindfulness is it's not something where you need to take uh, an inordinate amount of time I mean, I know you're really busy and you're moving back and forth doing this and that. It's the kind of thing where you can take a couple of minutes to kind of do some imagery. You can take um, a minute to do a, a, a breathing exercise. Uh, you know, you could even just close your eyes and kind of space out a little for, for a couple of minutes to kind of refresh yourself and get yourself uh, kind of back to where you want to be. 
So that's the fun. That that's I think is a, is a really critical in, in mindfulness. This idea is it's not something that takes um, that you have to sit down for a, a thirty minute session. You can actually take a few minutes to kind of refresh and 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 regroup. Yeah, it's, it's a really great point. Uh, one of the exercises I've been doing for years is um, focusing on my breath, so mindful breathing. And so I'll breathe in. I'll say. Um, Breathe in one, breathe out one, breathe in two, breathe out two. And I'm always curious to see how far I get before I space out. And uh, when I'm under stress, I often get to two. I mean, it sounds so silly, but I, I literally get to two. And then I think I just, I'm thinking about something else, some stressor or whatever. Um, so I realize our website is right here on this slide, but it's also in the chat if you just want to copy it. Um, so examples of mindfulness, mindful breathing, sitting, walking, eating, stretching, listening, seeing. I added pooping. My wife didn't appreciate that at all, but uh, I thought it was kind of funny. And maybe it works, who knows? So this question then of what is the relationship of mindfulness uh, and the restorative function and supervision? So, Mindfulness can act as a linking skill. And a colleague described this to me years ago when I was doing a, a skills group with clients at the State Psychiatric Hospital. And I, I was just so struck by how quickly they learn these skills, uh, these social skills. And the research I had read was that it took many, many weeks uh, for folks to learn these skills. And so I, I, I couldn't understand it, I couldn't explain it. And, and he said, well, you, you really established a linking skill in that they had these skills and they had atrophied um, and just not been used. And once you kind of identify that this is what we're doing now, they, they uh, resuscitated these skills uh, and were able to use them much more quickly than uh, it was kind of the idea of rehabilitation versus habilitation. So mindfulness can act as a linking skill so that we can connect the awareness of the need to use this skill with having the skill. I know it sounds bizarre, but like, um, so many of us know that working out makes us feel better, but we don't work out or eating particular food makes us feel well and eating a different food makes us not feel well. Um, and so mindfulness gives us this opportunity to make a conscious decision uh, to move in the direction of restoration uh, or not. You know, you, of course, you don't always have to make that decision. Um, so the research on, on mindfulness is increasingly powerful that it, that it takes time to, to uh, and it's, it's like a muscle that if you practice mindfulness, you'll get better at it. And it can have real, real dividend, pay real dividends in your life. Yeah, kind of builds self-awareness, I think. I think that's one, that's one of the benefits of it. Um, and when you build your own self-awareness, I think it kind of sharpens your awareness of what other people uh, are experiencing and feeling as well. Yeah, I, uh, I was talking to a, a woman who's a, a nurse, psychiatric nurse, and she's been doing mindfulness exercises and meditation for 20 years. And she said that what she noticed was she spends less time being in a negative headspace and um, she snaps out of it, you know, she becomes aware of it through mindfulness much more quickly and, and then can make other choices and focus on gratitude or that kind of thing. And that was my experience. And now we all, you know, we're all at different levels and there are days and weeks and months where I'm, I'm not so good. Uh, but I spend a lot less time uh, in, in a negative place. So I take that as a, as a positive. And the ability to look at your practice, I think, is such is so critical to both being a good supervisor and 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 being a good practitioner. The yeah. idea that you that that you can understand where you're coming from and where other people are coming from, it helps you to be able to kind of meet in a common place. Um, so I think it really is critical. I just realized I had my video on the whole time. I hope I wasn't doing anything offensive. Uh, <laughs> but yes, agree, absolutely. So here's another activity uh, that we've done routinely. I learned this one in the uh, 
dialectical behavioral therapy program we do at, at work at, at the state hospital. And it's just the idea of, of doing a round in a group supervision setting and um, from zero to 10, how burnt out are you feeling today? And it's not really technically the, the construct I referred to before, but it's just the, the more um, colloquial use of burnout. Um, and uh, it gives people an opportunity if they're really not in a good place, they can you know, give you a high number and we can you know, take efforts to support them and kind of unpack that a bit. I just did a supervision last week where somebody gave a really high number and she ended up saying, I, I, I just really need to talk to someone like I'm not okay. Um, and she said, I, wouldn't, I really wasn't that conscious of just how bad I was feeling uh, until we started to talk about it. So it, I think it served her really well. Uh, some of the other, uh, there's, there's a whole bunch of exercises for team building. So there's, there's nothing unique to these exercises. And I, I don't know that there's any best practices other than perhaps mindfulness. Um, but uh, so we do a whole bunch of team building exercises, including interviewing one another uh, in, in teams. And we've done this at the state psychiatric hospital and fascinating uh, people after interviewing one another, they said, I've worked with this person for years and I never knew anything about them really. Like they, they just had such a professional, um, professional boundaries. Um, so some of the questions we've used are what are your hobbies? What are you most proud of uh, is, is often uh, very interesting. What's something about you that most people don't know, <laughs> do not know. Um, and if you were not working here, what would you be doing? What do you most like about your work? Of course, if the person's burnt out, that could be a loaded question, I suppose. Um, but we've had really good success um, with doing these kind of exercises and just promoting team building in general. Uh, feel free, if, if anyone does a particular team building, if you put it in the chat, we're always looking for more uh, good examples of things we can use. Okay, another um, example of a restorative activity uh, has to do with self-care rounds. Um, so similar to what we started with today, uh, we do a round just saying how, do, how you take care of yourself and uh, what's working for you. Um, and if you feel like you're weak in this area, that we encourage a person to identify something maybe they're interested in, uh, in trying and use the group as an accountability buddy or accountability structure. Uh, and we've done this many, many times and uh, people now really look forward to it. And a lot of people confess like, yeah, I didn't, I didn't drink more water, <laughs> you know, which that was their goal. Um, and uh, interestingly, I was, I was presenting at, a, uh, at, at Rutgers and a psychologist in the audience uh, said to me, you know, as psychologists, we know that we need at least as much caretaking as our clients. And I, you know, I was just so kind of flabbergasted because I, I thought, you know, our clients need so much right often and the, the needs are, can be so overwhelming. But I've come to really believe this, uh, that this ability to turn that uh, lens, that caretaking lens on ourselves uh, can be just really, really important. And I think, you know, some of our, our panelists are responding also. And, you know, the issue of, there's almost a dichotomy sometimes in terms of your expectations or people's expectations of you versus your expectations or unmet expectations of others. Um, you know, the kind of the idea that, um, you know, we're expected to do, to work really, really hard. And I think for a lot of people, this pandemic has really been uh, really difficult and people have gone, ended up going above and beyond. And you sometimes do wonder whether or not these expectations are realistic and whether or not people actually appreciate, appreciate you for what you do. Yeah. You know, and it is very tough, you know, have, you know, you, you work, then you, how do you separate your work life from your, your home life? You know, you, you're working during the day and then you got kids, uh, uh, 
when you get home and it, it we really do need really do need a, a, the capacity to provide self-care for each other, for ourselves to really have some go to uh, again activities that we can to kept, kind of move us out of it because the stress becomes overwhelming um, and you need resiliency because resiliency is what helps you with the uncertainty. And, and, and I think when you go into work every day, <laughs> there's a certain level of uncertainty, particularly now. Jeez. And when you go home, there's a certain uh, degree of resilient of rather um, certain uh, degree of, and yep. uh, uncertainty. Yeah. of uncertainty and and you walk down the street and there's a certain degree of uncertainty or at least more than there was before so you really you really do i mean and i and i just want to take this you know opportunity to say to to to, to folks you know you do a hell of a job and it is a very tough job um and oftentimes we don't get the kind of validation that we that we we feel we deserve. It's 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 not an uncommon feeling. So the fact that that you kind of do it and 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 do it so well is really a, a, a tribute. Yeah, it's such a good point. I mean, as I'm listening to you, Joe, I, this idea of uh, giving ourselves permission for self-care and to, th to think about what we need, um, I, I, it, it's just so important. Um, it, there, you know, our culture often rewards kind of the martyrdom, like, I, you know, I, I stayed later and actually as supervisors, we often model this where you work harder than everyone else, um, but there, there are certainly dangers inherent in that. So it's a good point. So these next few slides are actually, yeah, you guessed it, slides. Yes, they're slides. Here's a green one. Kind of unnerving. Can't hear either of you. <laughs> this always cracks me up. So let's do some pro tip review. Um, so the first pro tip was the, the idea, these are pro tips for uh, supervisors or administrators. The first pro tip is if possible to separate the support or restorative function from the accountability or normative function. And of course, this is because of the tension that exists between trying to have psychological safety and people to be vulnerable or capable and willing to be vulnerable, uh, balanced against uh, the need for accountability in this, this work we do. Uh, so that's a tough one, but that's pro tip number one. Pro tip number two um, is that vulnerability creates trust, not the other way around. And I, I heard you when you said that, you know, there, there are situations and groups of people where vulnerability is not the way to go. Um, and that's okay. And then lastly, uh, pro tip number three, which we didn't really talk about but this, but this is um, that what Joe described earlier, this idea that supervisors are in a really difficult position uh, many times where they're squished between uh, their supervisees who need support and uh, need their attention, and as well as being squished between an organization that may be making poor decisions or, <laughs> right, particularly now, and I, you know, I don't even fault many of the people in leadership because it's been so difficult to predict uh, what the future is going to hold. And so I highly recommend uh, that supervisors seek out uh, other supervisors for peer support or just su seek out support uh, through professional organizations anywhere you can find it. Uh, we do a project here called Meta Supervision, which is supervision for supervisors. And um, I find it extremely helpful. And some of the other folks that attend it have said it's the it's one of the best professional experiences of their life because they they really feel validated by their peers. Um, so I can't recommend it highly enough if you can do it. And I know you know people are time pressured uh, in this field all, always. 
So with that, um, it's all we have for you today. And um, what time is it? Have just a few minutes. If you have any comments uh, about the presentation, about this idea of restorative supervision, uh, feel free to put them in the chat. I'm gonna stop the sharing and I'm gonna, there I am. So I don't know if you can see behind me, but uh, I'm in my workshop and uh, this is actually not a fake, you know, that's real. And uh, if you join us from some of the other sessions, I'm gonna do an elf on the shelf and I'm just gonna move them around for each session so you can see if you can find them. Uh, so what are we seeing in the chat? Anything, Joseph? Hey, uh, uh, excellent presentation, thank you. Okay. And hopefully people learned a few, uh, yeah, a few things. What we will do, by the way, is we will um, make available the uh, uh, <clears throat> the PowerPoints. Uh, there will actually be a recording of this uh, actual uh, presentation uh, that you'll have availability to as well. So, so if, um, people are having, if people are having trouble sleeping, they can watch this uh, presentation right. over and over. <laughs> well, also uh, interesting, as someone said, hope more organizations take this on. Oh, good. Yeah, it, it really is. Uh, it really is critical. We find we, I'm doing some work now with a with a housing program here uh, on developing resilience among staff, and we're starting out with the supervisors to try to give them. Uh, some skills uh, so that they can bring kind of this message of resilience to uh, to the staff, and and we've gotten a lot of support from upper management, and and I think again, resilience and what we're talking about today requires, uh, as Hillary said, a village. You know, your organization needs to be a village. Right, and I I'm also respectful of you know, the one person put in the chat, just this idea that professional webinars kind of set a high bar and um, that th th they are absolutely correct that particularly now this work is really difficult when you are under your own kind of personal stress and COVID stress. And so I respect that. Uh, and I, so I, I would focus on self-care and, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. One person wants to know if they can uh, they can use a few ideas and statements uh, in a class tomorrow. Yep. Eh, you know why not? If yep. was, if something struck you as as being important and uh, sharing, we need to share this stuff because I'm sure you're aware that many agencies aren't as oh um, resilient and uh, uh, don't uh, make providing self-care for yourself as, as easy uh, as, uh, as they should. Uh, but what I'm going to task you with, though, is, is the next time you see one of your supervisees and they need to take a break, insist they take that break. Yeah. Yeah, and just about everything in this presentation I stole from someone else. So uh, yeah, you're free to use whatever you want. <laughs> All right. Credit, that'd be great. But so I think that's uh, the end of our time. Thank you so much, everyone. You Stay were the safe. Best, best group I had today, by far. Turn off the video. All right, we recorded, so we're good. Yeah, I stop, I'm stopping the recording.